Best Book Bits podcast brings you Mackenzie Andrus, a poet, copywriter, classical philosophy lover, and author of the book, A Simple But Effective Strategy for Success. Mackenzie, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Michael. Big no fan worries. of your show. Yeah, for, my audience who, uh, don't, for my audience who don't know who you are, tell us a little bit about yourself, your younger years, and the journey, how you got here so far. Yeah, so I'm about... Uh, 23 years old, turning 24 soon. I started uh, writing a couple years ago, but I didn't take it seriously until about two years ago. And then I started writing for university students because I was really into the classics and the humanities. And I was writing all these essays and wasn't really going anywhere with it or making much money. And then I had a buddy who was actually into marketing and I didn't know a single thing about marketing. Like still, there's so much to learn about that. And to be a copywriter, you have to be a marketer. But he's like, hey, I could make you more money if you want to write for me and learn how to write. And it's, it was a lot more simple writing because I actually uh, I don't have like an English degree or any of that. So, it, And lots of people say that can hurt you in copywriting skills because you're too worried about sounding smart rather than selling the stuff, right? But then the book is actually a funny story. So it was uh, supposed to be a lead magnet for my business when I first started. But uh, then, I, since I didn't know anything about marketing, I kind of made it for just uh, self-help readers in general, which isn't my target audience. Like, there are tons of people who read self-help books and would listen to your podcast that wouldn't need my copywriting services because they don't necessarily have anything for sale yet. So I'm glad I wrote it, but it's, it's a funny story. I wrote it for the wrong purpose, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Whereabouts, um, whereabouts did you grow up and whereabouts did you go to university? Um, I went to uh, college in uh, Calgary, Alberta. It's called SAIT uh, Institute of Technology. Just did some project management courses there. And then I realized like, uh, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to get an actual degree in anything. So just did kind of some certificates. And went to high school, Calgary, Alberta too. Uh, I'm glad my parents brought me here because... They grew up in Edmonton, which is just a town up north, and we kind of have like this neighbor, neighborly rivalry, and it's just not a nice, it's a nicer town, Calgary. So glad I grew up here. Now I live uh, downtown, get to talk to people, see more people, right? Next to the mountains, yep. too. And with your writing, what, what was your, um, with your obsession with writing, where, where did the poetry sort of start with there? What, what was the first sort of creative pieces of writing that you started to do? In grade seven, in grade three, I wrote with one of my friends, Star Wars Episode Seven. We were just, we were like writers, we were creators. Uh, and when they, when Disney published Star Wars Episode Seven, I was like, oh, they ripped me off. <laughs> Even though I did a better job, I, I brought Darth Maul back and certain things that they did in uh, the Disney Clone Wars series. So it's like. I felt like they read mine, even though all we did was like print my little book and hand it out in our elementary school. <laughs> so I don't know how they would have got it. We didn't put it online. But, and then, yeah, I've kind of been writing my whole life. But not to, I haven't published much, any fiction or anything. So kind of uh, into the philosophy self-help right now. Fiction, you kind of got to go crazy yeah. to, to get good at, right? Like, just imagine George R. R. Martin, who wrote Game of Thrones, sitting sitting in his office hours a day coming up with that plot, right? <laughs> Talking about the characters to his wife who don't exist, all this stuff, right? <laughs> where, did your, uh, where did your obsession with classical um, philosophy come in and, and what's the story about knowing all the emperors chronologically? You know, that's a good one. I actually don't, can't think of where that kind of took off or started. It's, it might have been like YouTube historians, like got me into history and whatnot. And uh, I think it was like maybe fantasy and fiction that got me into that whole thing. And then realizing that all the, the fantasy and the fiction and the tales we tell are all kind of repeats of the classics in their own way. Especially, uh, I was a big Disney kid, right? And all the Disney movies are extreme remakes of the classics, you know? And... Uh, that kind of got me into the whole telling the story theme, right? But uh, there's this one podcast or 
and YouTube series you should check out. Anyone who likes Roman history should check out. It's called The History of Rome. Um, I forget who it's by. It's just called The History of Rome. And there's like 20, 30 hours of one-hour episodes. And it's insane. It, it goes chronologically from the... Because it, it was a kingdom, right? There was Romulus and Remus. They were the kings. And then there was the uh, Republic. And then when Caesar was the first dictator... And after Caesar, it never went back to being a republic. It was always a dictatorship, essentially. They still had republicans. And nowadays, the U.S. government and most big democracies in the world base that off of uh, Roman history. The reason they have a president and a figurehead is because people liked having a dictator. Or people liked having, I guess, because some, some would argue that Caesar wasn't a dictator because uh, he wasn't, by definition, a military dictator. He, he did certain things that... Hitler didn't do, for example, like give bread to people and win votes. <laughs> but the reason we have a figurehead is because of that system. And then we still have Republicans because the figurehead's not smart enough to rule everyone. <laughs> so I advise everyone, yeah, got it. anyone who, something learned, new. who wants to look into how our society works to study historical societies. Yeah, awesome. Learn something new every day. And um, <laughs> can you name the emperors chronologically off the top of your head? <laughs> You know, I could after that podcast, but uh, right now, I don't think I could. I could, if you put me a list in them, I could mismatch them, but maybe starting at Caesar, you know, and then there's like uh, Octavian, because their names all get confused too, because Octavian was Caesar, he was also Octavius, <laughs> and a bunch of other things, and then it, his actual name by in the historical books is Augustus, but it's the same guy. <laughs> And that was yeah, like, it. It, so I can't name them no more. I can't name them no more. And that's because even if you learn something new every day, if you don't use it, you're going to forget it. <laughs> and I don't have a job teaching yeah. Roman history, so <laughs> I'm not going to remember it. No, I got it. No, it's one of the things that came up uh, on your profile, and uh, I thought I'd just ask you the question. But we're going to jump into your book yeah. soon, and you're going to talk about that. But first, I want to talk about your, your copywriting business. Um, how did that start? And... Um, how can people like myself or just the average folk improve their copywriting, some tips and, and some hacks as well? Yeah. Um, well, we have a blog that has uh, tons of good information. We try and post weekly on it. And you could subscribe to that at the blockbar.com. Uh, we do business and a little bit of growth, kind of personal growth tips. It's not like uh, like life coaching type stuff. But if you have a business, definitely growth tips and habits that will help you strategize properly and work efficiently um and my so my buddy got me into copywriting and then he gave me like all his marketing information and then he just kind of like stopped giving me clients or like i don't even know what he does anymore he just kind of like dropped off the face of the planet he doesn't much he doesn't really have a website or anything or any of that stuff so i just took his his uh, systems that he gave me started operating on my own started researching my own systems and uh, when you start an agency, you get in these funnels on Facebook of other people's agencies where you're just getting tons of lead magnets, where a lot of them are their own agency operating procedures. So you can steal those and see if they work for your business. And they give you them for free. You just got to get on their mailing list. And one tip I have for every copywriter, or even uh, if you want to advertise an e-commerce agency or anything, is to have a swipe file. So that's an email that isn't your good email that you sign up to all these accounts and newsletters for. So then when you go into that, you can just see all good headlines, good email marketing, good lead magnets. It's just like a treasure trove for copywriters and marketers, essentially. And it'll get messy if you do it in your yeah. personal one. <laughs> Look, I've got a problem with copywriting itself. I mean, it all reverts back to, you know, sales and money. But at the end of the day, uh, I think good copywriting or good writing uh, comes from the heart and is authentic. Uh, I know I haven't really used copywriting services myself and I do all my emails myself, all my writing, all my, all my stuff personally. Mm -hmm. And I think all, being authentic with writing and basically talking about how you how you feel instead of writing from a, a point of I want to make 
money from this particular email, post, article, book, whatever it is. Uh, so I think there's a little bit of a disconnect between selling and actually talking and being genuine as well. And I, I think people can really pick up on that and read that too. But um, yeah, strange world of, of copyright and, and, and that's your business. It's uh, yeah, it, it's definitely worth its uh, weight for certain businesses that, that just want to transact. Um, yeah. Any other tips or, or tricks people can improve in their, in their copywriting that you know? Well, I'd say when you're starting out, uh, don't do work you don't like. When you're starting out, you you can you got to work for whoever, right? But don't later on, don't do work you don't enjoy. Don't do work you don't love. I just turned down a client. It was a big, big client. They wanted me to write like thousands of words per month, and uh, it was for casinos. And that's why I turned it down because I'm I'm not a big gambler. I don't understand all the rules of gambling games, and all the copywriting was like rules of gambling games you earn this 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 and i would have had to like change my whole industry to to learn how to just write copy for them and like you said if they're authentic and that person who owns that agency or that company actually likes gambling and likes what they're doing and what they're talking about it'll be easy for them to write about it right and yeah they'll believe in what they're writing what they're they have to give not necessarily what they're selling Yes, yeah, so only work in the areas that you're proficient in and have sort of an understanding or even a, a passion for as well. Yeah. Nah, totally, totally good. Now, jumping into your book, um, I know you've said it's a blend between copywriting and a self-help uh, book in, into a story. So when did, when did it come about and what was the idea of, of publishing uh, and writing the book? What was that process like? Um, so it came out about 10 months ago, I think uh, January. 2021 um and honestly it was a good grind for me because i i wanted to do it as a lead magnet like i said so i had i had a business partner at this time who uh, i no longer work with he works with another company um but we're still good buddies uh unfortunately we don't talk as much he he says he has this uh what's it called no talk policy where he can't talk about his clients or his agency outside of work and i'm like oh that's very professional but I want to know what you're doing, <laughs> how we can help each other. Um, but so I was just grinding every day, like uh, an hour or two a day. And uh, I got it done. And I had never written any long form things. Like when I wrote, even when I wrote the pieces in my school days, they were only like a couple thousand words, a couple pages type things. Uh, this is my largest piece. And it's still only 10, 11,000 words. Like, uh, 40 50 pages right so i kind of wrote it for people who don't really like to read because my i grew up in a kind of a poorer neighborhood and no one really liked to read i don't know reading is kind of a that's when i, when I noticed that smarter people or not not smarter people uh, people with wealthier people read i started reading more and i started re i looked up the best book in the world to read and it was like dale carnegie how to win friends and influence people and that's one of the only books I've actually read like three times because I still fail to repeat the principles in it. And it's like the title of your book almost matters more than the content. But what I think the best titled book in the world is rich dad, poor dad, because that book is a story in the title, you know, and everyone knows that book. My friends who don't read my friends who barely read, they've read it. They'd be like, oh, yeah, even I've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I'm not rich yet, blah, 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 type, all this stuff. And you need money to get into real estate, which is what Robert Kiyosaki talks about. But it's still good principles. And the reason that book sells the most isn't because it's necessarily the best book. It's the best story, the best title, you know. That's what I yeah. think. So I'm trying to well, get non-readers to... into reading. <laughs> yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um kicking off with rich dad poor dad there's a, a story that the rich dad did not actually exist there's no evidence that he exists and robert's been pressed oh. on this but it doesn't really matter because uh, yeah exactly. because a it's a good story and and, and b it, it it drives the point home yeah. um so i think in story form talking about you know personal development or any or any information it's mm -hmm. best delivered in stories because we actually come from a from a tribal background with, with yeah. telling stories around the campfire uh, back mm -hmm. in the day and come from an oral tradition. 
uh, before we had the invention of video and audio. People yeah. had an oral tradition of learning, and that was through stories. But I want to jump into your book. I have read it, a fantastic book. So for more audience out there, grab a copy, A Simple But Effective Strategy for Success. Chapter one was great, uh, stay productive. And you talk about the difference between being proactive and productive. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so being productive is like, for example, I vacuum my apartment every single morning and it makes me feel productive. And lots of people would say that's a time waster. Lots of these uh, YouTube gurus and life coaches would be like, what's your time worth? Calculate your time, get a Roomba. You figure out that 15 minutes of vacuuming every day is actually taking up this much time, but not every single hour of my day am I getting paid, right? I'm not necessarily working when I, like I do get some royalties from the book and some other stuff that I don't have to necessarily work for per hour, but generally when I'm working per hour, it's I'm sitting down grinding and I'm trying not to be distracted and I'm trying to be in my productive mode. So when I vacuum my apartment in the morning, that makes me feel more content and productive or proactive throughout the day. And productivity is if you were to vacuum your house and it doesn't do anything for you. You know what I mean? So there's, yep. it's, it's like there's, my buddy had a good example. It's like when he said you can only do three big things per day, three main things per day. And I didn't, I didn't believe him at the time. I was like, what are you talking about? Three, three main things per day. And then I started filling up my, my, uh, my to, to do list for the day with like six, five, seven big things. And I wouldn't get them done. And it started to, uh, have a negative snowball effect where I would get less done and less done. And then I'd feel like, Oh, I don't need to get it done. Cause I didn't get it done yesterday. And it's, it then becomes okay in my mind to not, to go to bed at night without checking something off my list. But that's because I might have not prioritized my tasks. Like, for example, my girlfriend got me this nice business agenda, and I was writing it down, writing everything in there. And but I was writing things like have a smoothie, workout, vacuum, and it was just like too many things to check off. And I do those things anyway. But I just want three main things to do per day, and that that will be most productive, I believe. For most people yeah yeah the thing i got out of the chapter was it was the ability to produce so every day instead of being busy uh just mm. produce something get a result out of the day whether yeah. it be c creating something writing a few words doing something that moves the needle forward and kicks the ball forward yeah. every day uh that that's what i took out of it so that, that was a great chapter we're going to do a couple of speed rounds. So I'm going to go through some of the chapter heading topics and um, you tell me exactly what uh, you think that chapter was about. So we'll jump into chapter two, which you talk about love your work. So talk to me about that. Yeah, um, loving your work is important because if, like we said earlier, if I were to write for this casino business, I would get stressed out. I would become more negative. Uh, I'd start slowly hating my job and it would uh, seep into other areas of my life slowly. Like, and I'm not, not as like hard work isn't necessarily bad because when you work hard, you feel good after, right? But the, it has to be rewarding work. Like, for example, I don't mind, like, um, I used to landscape right out of high school, right? Mowing lawns for eight hours a day. That was hard. That was brutal at first. Now, when I go mow my lawn, it's fun because I have an hour or my mom's lawn, I don't have a lawn, I have an apartment. But when I go mow it, it's fun because it takes an hour and it makes me realize why I'm doing it, why I like it, why I have a lawn. And that, maybe one day I'll pay someone to mow my lawn, but probably not because I like that one hour using my yard. And loving your work is super important because it makes you more hyper-productive and what's it called, uh, exponentially productive. like. You, when you started Best Book Bits, you probably didn't do a book every single day, right? A book, a book review every single day. But now, now you're you're putting out a podcast every single day, right? And that's that's insane. Yeah, so, right. yeah, yeah. So when when you that affects other areas of your life. So when you want to make 
perhaps another project or something, you know you can do it because you've done it every single day in this area. And you've only done right. been able to do that's that right. because you like it. Even though once you like something, and you probably know this more than anyone, that you love something and then you make it you your job, it starts to become less uh, less rewarding, less fun, it seems, somehow. some It can seem like that. But that's something that I'm trying to work on and research into. Yeah, one of my t- one of my takeaways from it with a lot of your work is if you're going to be working anyway, whether it be 20, 30, 40, 60, 80 hours a week, you might as well love what you do because it won't feel like work. And as it, it's hard work. So if you're going to do something for 3, 5, 10, 20 years, you yeah. might as well love it. And if you love it, it's not work. It just becomes play. Mm-hmm. So don't be working at a job you don't like because that is your life you're giving away. And if you're yeah. giving away your life to something that you don't love, well, that's not the best use of your time. And, and as you said, it's going to affect all other areas of your life, spiritually, yeah. mentally, relationships, health-wise. But if you love what you do, it's going to give you more energy than it takes. So that was my take on that. Um, yeah. And jumping into Chapters 3, Just Do It. I mean, it speaks for itself, the Nike logo, but what exactly did you mean about Just Do It? Just do it. Oh, so... That one is all about uh, screw the haters, discipline over motivation type thing, and uh, fail, 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 fail until you get good. So it's kind of like a kind of like the quantity over quality principle. Like I preach uh, something lots of other life coaches preach: uh, prolific quality output, which is uh, like obviously making stuff every day, making sure it's quality and outputting it. But you gotta you got to be able to write before you can write good. Like my first blogs, obviously way worse than my later blogs and they're just still slowly getting better. And I'm not sure if I've ever gone back to like the beginning of your podcast and <laughs> checked it out, but I'm sure you're not going to be as great as you are now. Cause like even summarizing my own book, you could do it way better than me. And that's because you summarize so many books, right? But yeah. Well, it. my first, when I started doing when I started doing audio summaries and video summaries, they sucked. And the reason why they sucked is, is because I was new to it. Um, And the more you do it, you do get better, but you do get confident. You can get confident and comfortable doing that as well in your own style. Um, At the end of the day, your writing, your voice, your your person. Not everyone is going to like it, which is great. But you will mm-hmm. find that that niche of people that that will understand and get it and become adapted to your work. But yeah, I love the prolific quality output. Um, that's what it's all about with just doing it. Number four is pretty easy in the chapter book. Become a listener. Um, what exactly do you mean by that? Do you mean listen more than you speak, or what, yeah, that's what, what do you mean by that? That's a a perfect uh, platonic preaching right there but uh so i wanted plato say i don't know he no that was socrates which is so like there's ev- no evidence of socrates existing right plato made him up or it's all plato's work but plato said socrates said um every man is my superior in that he knows something that i do not and that i learned from him and that hit me hard when i first learned that because i was a cocky cocky kid i got I was shorter. I was from a rough neighborhood. I had tougher friends, so I'd run my mouth in hopes that my friends would back me up and all this stuff. I got in a lot of fights. I got my teeth knocked in uh, three times. I'm going to get some surgery here so I can speak with my face uh, more publicly. But So I got in my fair share of fights, and uh, after listening to people, and uh, I realized people just want to be heard. and you don't really get in fights with people. Like I, I understand the whole testosterone manly thing. Like if someone disrespects my girlfriend, I, I gotta, I gotta t- man up. Right. But at the same time, but what if you just ask that guy what's wrong with him? You know what I mean? Like becoming a listener, it'll make you way more smart, way smarter. You know, when you're talking, you're not learning. I think it was Napoleon Hill who said that. So. Also, it also it sharpens the communication as well. So, if you, like Stephen Covey says, if you if you're coming from a point where you can understand instead mm-hmm. of just listen, um, I talk about in my book where a lot of people speak to 
So when someone's listening, they're thinking about the thoughts going on in their head. So once that person finished speaking, they just want to say what they're thinking, but they're not really taking in exactly what the other person actually said. So they're, yeah. they're speaking very reactive instead of um, proactive. Um, yeah. It sharpens communication, and it's, it's a lot better to be understood first, understand the other person, then to just speak your own mind and your own thoughts as well. So listening is, a, I think, one of the hardest skills uh, on the planet to actually nail. Um, chapter five in the book, you go through, go the extra mile, self-explanatory again. Um, how do you mean keep keep doing more than what you get paid for? What's the what's the analogy behind that chapter? Yeah, so it's like the this is kind of like the employee complex, uh, but uh, so a lot of entrepreneurs are very anti anti establishment, anti employee, or whatever, and that's that's because the only your business can't work without you. You operate at a loss because you're giving them a return. You know what I mean? So you're making more cash flow for your business than you're getting in return. And, but going the extra mile is going to be the reason that you get promoted. It's going to be the reason that you get a raise. Even if you've only been at a company for a month versus someone who's been there for two, three years, right? So I got, I got uh, promoted to, uh, I forget what, what this job was. Oh yeah, I got promoted to uh, the head of uh, advertising for this one um, nonprofit agency after a month when they've had online people there for years, right? And that's because I called them like, and I wrote them every day on things and how I could help them. I gave them way more hours of my time than they initially said they were going to pay me for and then they're like well let's give this guy something you know so you go the extra mile but you can't expect anything in return for it you have to if that'll make you resentful it'll i think if steve this is like john maxwell's principle you obviously know him big uh big speaker guy um you can't if you expect anything in return for it it can only lead to resentment because not everyone is going to return your favors so you have to do the favors because you want to yeah, absolutely. I think that segue backs into loving your work. If you love your work, you'll go the extra mile because you don't see it as going the extra mile. But if you hate your work, well, it's going to be very hard to go the extra mile because you're going to hate going the extra mile. So it all yeah. blends in, um, you know, loving your work, just doing it, becoming a listener, going the extra mile. And chapter yeah. six, you talk about visualize success, visualize your victory. Um, obviously, it's very self-explanatory. Visualize your successes while you're not successful. Is that what you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, you have to uh, imagine that you already act like that. Like, if you, uh, for example, when I got, um, when I wrote, doubled my income from just working for like $20 an hour to working from home, I doubled my income, but I didn't change my spending habits. So I was spending more, more, just more money on useless crap that I would have otherwise not been because people who make that money are used to making that money. So they've, they've, uh, they almost, and their parents, maybe they had wealthier parents. So their parents taught them how to use money from a younger age. And so when they finally came to that money, they were better with it. But lots of people I know from my neighborhood, they'll get like, uh, they'll get a big wad of cash for some reason, like, uh, Maybe they won a scratch ticket or something. Buddy, I had a buddy who won 20 grand at 18. He was broke in a couple months. And that's like what I was making per year before then. So but I, another thing back about going the extra mile is when I was uh, working with a buddy in construction, he there'd just be like a simple thing like a nail on the ground. And he'd be like, oh, we don't got to pick it up. It's not a job. And I'd be like... Someone's going to step on it. We're the ones with hammers and nails in here. Let's just pick it up or kick it to the side. Just And for some reason, that little thing stuck with me. Because he's, he's still working for that job the same wage. And he could have got a promotion if he had just went a little, picked up a screw. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think it all comes back down to attitude as well. And uh, one of the last chapters I want to jump into and go into some of the, you talk about learn from the experts. Uh, we can go through the list of the experts you mentioned in the book, but tell me who were who some of your early mentors or uh, some of the authors or great books that, that you've come across? I've got the list here. Oh yeah, so I had a, a personal mentor who he, te he teaches me classics. I still kind of uh, talk to him sometimes. He went to Ber UC Berkeley for uh, like uh, classical studies or something. So a lot more uh, educated than me. But he, which is why I, I wanted to work with him because I'm like, oh, hey, look at me, this college dropout. I just got a, uh, I found a mentor at Berkeley, and he's the one who gave me all my content to start my classics pages. You know, I wasn't the guy who research, who found out how to download all these versions of the Bhagavad Gita with all these uh, links in the text on uh, readings that you can read and practices that you can do. He found all that. He curated all that. He just, and then I said, can I take this over for you? Because he's kind of going crazy. He doesn't like Facebook. Or he's trying to get people to go to MeWe, this platform with no ads, which is funny because now Facebook is my almost my baby because of the ads, right? <laughs> That's Facebook's strongest thing. And yep. MeWe is a social platform that you have to pay for, but there's no ads. So people don't mind seeing ads since they don't have to pay for it. But uh, my mentors, I, Robert Kiyosaki, obviously Rich Dad Poor Dad, I just like how he's uh, very anti-authority and uh, but some of the stuff he says is, is hilarious. Like I was watching a video with my dad because my dad is actually the one who gave me Rich Dad Poor Dad. That's, that's funny. Totally. Uh, he's like, he's like, don't grow up like me. <laughs> but uh, then we were watching a video of him the other day. Just I was making dinner. I like putting on random YouTube uh, self help stuff when I'm cooking and whatnot or classical music. And Robert Kiyosaki just like makes it look so easy, right? <laughs> he's like, this is all you got. Well, a do. lot of people don't know Robert Kiyosaki. He's he's written probably a good um, a good dozen to maybe two dozen books yeah. after. Rich Dad Poor Dad, and one of his new ones is a book called Fake, which I've got on my shelf through there. He talks about okay, yeah. fake money, fake assets, uh, really strong vocal uh, opponent against, obviously, the, the money system. Uh, so mm -hmm. someone who has made it has realized mm -hmm. that it's not all what it's cracked up to be. I think he's gone to the root of the problem and realized, you know, the fiat money system that, you know, it's, it's corrupted from day one. Uh, I call it economic slavery. We all live under economic slavery. Uh, most decisions people make have got to do with uh, economics. And uh, I think we're shifting, shifting away from that thought pattern as well and, and being economic slaves. Uh, but yeah, that's the reality we live in currently at the moment. Um, some of the self-improvement classics you, you've got there as well. So you talk about sort of a man thinketh. Uh, you've got Grant Cardone, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Deepak Chopra, Tony Robbins, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. So some yeah. of the, a lot of those books I've summarized and put on my channel as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Fa fantastic, fantastic books. I've Any other read, takeaways uh, uh, from those self? Yeah. Well, I just want to say I really like, uh, well, I like, I recently got into Jordan Peterson because he's a uh, myth, mythological and uh, classically educated. He's a very educated guy and he's from Alberta, which is my home province. Uh, a very small town so in the beginning of his book 12 rules for life he talks about uh big drinking in his small town and all this stuff right and mm. one thing he talked about that i really liked is how he was working on like the railroad and all these guys were just being hard asses on each other and they'd be like that and that's because like if one guy dropped a drop something or something it could it could screw everything up and everyone could get hurt and you had to be on on your heels in that job and he, that guy couldn't couldn't make the cut because he just couldn't keep up with the uh, the bantering and bickering. It's like being on a pirate ship, you know. You gotta with a bunch of dudes. You you gotta be in it, right? You gotta get your stuff together. And he because he's like he's obviously not a big burly construction guy anymore. He's a Harvard educated professor, pretty scrawny if you ask me. But no, he he said he used to bench uh, 185 pounds but he's an excellent speaker and then his um his writing his writing is just very basic i find it's very very simple he he speaks so eloquently and then his writing he just tries to convey it simply and i 
I like, yeah. I sometimes am the opposite. I, I just talk like an idiot. I just say, um, all the time and what, and all these slang words. And then I, when I try and write, I try and make myself sound so poetic and smart and metaphorical and references, but, um, it's a yeah, part of growth. It's a part of growth, though. So I think the the older you get, the the more simple your words are because you sort of want to cut very very straight instead of going round yeah. in circles. I met Jordan Peterson in Melbourne. I met Jordan Peterson in Melbourne one on one, which was a great experience a, a couple of years ago before he got sick. Uh, I literally ran into him on the street, uh, walking through the streets of Melbourne, and had a chat with him. And yeah, awesome. great guy, um, really nice guy really yeah. humble like super super humble um yeah. a couple other questions i want to wrap up before we jump off the uh podcast so uh i want to know what are you working on at the moment uh or any any places where people can sort of find you on on social media or where, where do you sort of hang out and and what are you working on at the moment so i don't like telling people what i'm working on in the moment until it's done because then they're expecting sure. something but uh, I almost want to tell you just so I have to do it. So right now we're working on uh, the Block Bard YouTube documentaries. So we're going to take um, yeah. all of the classics pages that we have um, and turn them into uh, uh, 30 to 45 minute films just with like basic nice stock footage like most of the YouTube documentaries are. No one wants to see me on my computer desk talking for 45 minutes. They want to see... If I'm talking about Greece, they want to see uh, drone shots of Greece and all this stuff. And uh, so we're working with um, some photographers and filmers. And right now I'm working on finding an editor because I'm writing the script and everything. But I do not want to get into all that computer editing stuff. I think I have a little too many things on my plate. And then also some animations for my poems, my historical poems. Uh, I want them to be super sick, super kind of like Ted Ed. Ted Ed animations, just like uh, five minute videos. You've seen those, right? Um, yeah, yep. people like that. And it explains things super simply. And they can find me, um, you can uh, join uh, my Facebook page, the Block Bard Writing Service. Uh, we just made a Facebook group called The Art of Advertising. We're gonna help people advertise their arts, their business, their pages. Uh, Cause I find, I like helping out artists and authors and. A lot of very creative people, they don't have very many sales skills or they don't find the, and they don't uh, want to either because they want to just get better at their creative work. But like, uh, they won't, like I said, the title is almost more important than the content, you know? Um, if Lord, Lord of the Rings wouldn't sell if it was called Sauron or if it was called Isildur or one of the guy's names, right? It has to be, it, and Star Wars says right in it what it is right it's a war in the stars <laughs> um yeah and they can find yeah, me on instagram unfortunately, you, yeah you do yep instagram at maculus uh or the block bard it's just our historical poems page right now they're both kind of connected and uh yeah i'm not really on twitter or youtube or anything yet so awesome awesome yeah i'm jumping into uh starting to create documentaries got a nice. couple of ideas and i'm working on a few at the moment so being a creative person myself uh, i've always wanted to be a, a documentary filmmaker but i'm going to start mm -hmm. simple and make some really simple documentaries first and then uh work up through there as well uh one of the yeah. last questions i want to ask you and i'm interested to hear your people so if you were to host a dinner party or go out for dinner uh with three people from the past dead or alive who would they be what would you serve them or where would you take them oh my gosh well, three people well, should have let me prepare for this one. Um, no, top of your head. Okay. Jesus Christ, if he existed. Yep. <laughs> um, yep. I want to say Julius Caesar because he's just yep. so sick. Caesar. <laughs> and uh, this last one could be interchangeable because I'm picking it on the spot, but it'd probably be another another leader of sorts, or not even a leader. Maybe maybe just a smart dude like probably Plato. Jesus Christ, 
Julius Caesar yeah. and Plato. Holy crap, that'd be a dinner party. Plato. And where would I take him? Uh, I'd take him to McDonald's. Show him how we live. McDonald's, yeah, that, that would be cool. In the 21st cool. century. So Jesus, Caesar, and Plato at McDonald's. Uh, fast forward to Bill and Ted, excellent adventure. You put him in that little, um, put him in the phone booth, plug him in now. Yeah. and take him to McDonald's. So that would be uh, that would be a great conversation, and uh, that would be a great documentary to uh, yeah. to see as well. But uh, no, nah, cool. Yeah. Well, Mackenzie, I appreciate you you coming on the podcast and uh, giving us your time. Uh, for my right. audience uh, who now know you a little bit more, uh, go out there, check out his book, A Simple But Effective Strategy for Success. If you need some help in the areas of copywriting, check out his business. Uh, how do you spell the business again? It's uh, You said it's Block Bard, is that correct? Yeah, just block, block Bard. Block Bard, yeah, because we on the block and we the Bard. <laughs> Got it. No problem. Mackenzie, thanks for being on the podcast and have yourself a great day. Thanks for having me, Michael. You too. Right on. Bye. No worries at all. Speak soon. Okay, bye.